Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, second session of the uh, GATCO BALPA Controller Pilot Symposium entitled Excellent at Work, Qualities Which Make Controllers and Pilots Stand Out. My name is Jess Pigden. I'm your chair for this morning. I'm uh, part of the GATCO Executive Board and I'm just about to retire after 30 years working as a controller. I was formerly head of safety investigations for NATS, uh, sorry, for, at the London Control Centre and I've got a master's degree in human factors uh, from Coventry University. So last week's session looked at the management of contrails to help reduce the effect of aviation on global warming. If you missed it, it is available online. So today's session is going to focus on the humans, the pilots and controllers, and we'll look at the skills, the traits and practices that we excel at, why they're important and how we can develop them further. We've got two great speakers. Helen Heenan is a human factor specialist and she's also the uh, HF lead for the RE Royal Aeronautical Society Flight Ops Group. And then we've got Martin Bromley, OBE, training captain and founder of the Clinical Human Factors Group. As you just heard, this session is being recorded and can also everyone please make sure their videos are off and their microphones are on mute. If anyone has any questions, please submit them using the Q&A function on the webinar. The chat function is for general comments only and there'll be time at the end for questions after the two presentations. So without any further ado, can I introduce Martin uh, for his presentation? Thank you very much, uh, Jez, and thank you everyone. Just bear with me while I try and uh, share my screen. I suddenly realized that it was a long time since uh, I'd done a, a Zoom presentation and now I had to relearn how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm also not particularly good with technology, I should add, and I learned that a number of years ago when uh, air traffic used to be down at West Drayton and had a go at the simulator. And there are a couple of challenging things about it for me. The first was that being a pilot, I used to think it was all about me, uh, but I soon discovered that uh, as an air traffic controller, you've got to think about everybody else. Uh, can I also apologise, by the way, that you may have heard some interference in the background. My cat has just decided to force the door open and walk in and come and speak to me, so I may have to remove him in just a moment. Uh, so thanks very much everyone for the privilege of, of speaking today. I'm going to explore what this thing is about excellence and, and give you a perspective on it. Um, my unique perspective, I suppose, is, is that I have been lucky to work with some other safety critical industries. Uh, and so uh, as has been mentioned, I'm a training captain. I'm on the Airbus A320. Uh, the picture on the left is over 20 years ago as I was being base trained on the A330. And I only include that because I like to remind people that I did used to have hair. Uh, I'm also a CRM trainer as well. Uh, I'm a total aviation person. I love flying. I still get to do aerobatics and uh, I'm never happier than when I'm up in the air. I thought it might be useful just to start and objectively assess, are we actually good at what we do? So this is data that's taken from uh, Boeing and from IATA that gives you a sense of progress in aviation safety. So the accident rate in 1960 was uh, 30 per million departures. Um, by 1996, it dropped to 1.2 per million departures. The significance of 1996 is that that's when I, uh, I got my first uh, aviation, my commercial aviation uh, job. And at the time, I remember that uh, the journals like Flight International were, were talking about the challenge of the coming couple of decades, that air travel was going to double in size and that suddenly we were going to have a problem maintaining this excellent safety uh, rate, uh, accident rate that we had. We were, we, you know, 1.2 per million departures was considered uh, an amazing achievement. What we actually know now is that over the next 20, over the, the, the 20 years that followed, we actually not only maintained that safety rate, but we improved it even more down to 0.3 per million departures. And, and when I get to work in other industries, these, this is the sort of data, this is the sort of information that they would love to see. Um, and so I think objectively we can say, actually, we've done some really good stuff, but it goes without saying, of course, that we can't afford to be complacent uh, in any of this. 
Uh, naturally, I'd like to take credit for the, my role in this since 1996, but sadly, I know it's not just me. Uh, and of course, what we all know is actually down to someone else uh, as clearly uh, very humbly takes responsibility for what we've got. So my real contribution to today is less about my aviation background um, and less about any kind of qualifications I might have in this role, uh, but it's much more about my time with, with uh, other safety critical industries. And over the last 17 years, I've worked in a voluntary capacity in healthcare. And as a result, I've also got to work with a number of other industries uh, and systems, and that's ranging from thermal power generation, police, nuclear engineering, uh, and a little bit of a contribution to Eurocontrol's work on just culture. But I just want to very briefly share my personal story of how I got involved. So here's a picture of my uh, wife in 2005, Elaine, with our two young children, Victoria and Adam. Uh, Elaine had gone into hospital for routine surgery on her sinuses and probably some of the uh, flying colleagues in the audience will have gone through a similar procedure. Uh, after she was anaesthetized, problems occurred, uh, an emergency developed, uh, but unfortunately what happened wasn't what you would have hoped and uh, sadly she remained unconscious and uh, eventually died 13 days after the original attempted operation. As you would expect, I, I wanted to, you know, look after my children. I wanted to get back to my life uh, and my everything was in chaos. But what I also was conscious of is that I didn't really understand what had happened. In the end, I was granted an independent review. Um, it's a very long story, but, but in summary, uh, when the emergency had occurred, um, there was um, really a, a failure around situational awareness. The, the situational awareness of the whole team, and there were about seven people at the end of the case present, was not shared. The three doctors all had slightly different ideas of what was going on and what needed to happen. There had been no briefing or consideration of what ifs. Uh, but sadly, other members of the team were well aware of what was happening, but were unable to communicate. Um, the decision making had failed to prioritise what was actually going on. The leadership broke down. In fact, in the inquest, uh, there was a dispute in the inquest about who was actually in charge. And, and the workload management, if you want to call it that, and here I'm taking this from the IKO um, framework, pilot competencies that we use. The workload management um, was uh, really not optimal. Uh, there had been a panic reaction, focusing and fixating on a solution, um, but without taking a moment to pause to consider what was what was going on and what might be happening. I've just given you a very simple view, but but I'll come back to it in a moment. But obviously you know i got back to my role flying but at the same time i was still wondering what can we learn from this what can we take from this how can we make a difference 2007 having met a number of uh, really clever people like professor jim reason um, professor rona flynn and characters like that i founded the clinical human factors group that charity has been going now 15 years. I, I'm no longer the chair, fortunately, I'm just one of the trustee team. Um, but because we brought in some amazing people, both from the world of healthcare and from the world of academia, uh, we've been able to achieve um, a reasonable degree of influence, uh, particularly around areas of critical care and emergency care in healthcare. And we've also brought about some systemic changes to the whole healthcare system. One of the first people that I, I met after Elaine died was the doctor on the right in this picture, Professor Sid Watkins. He was then the chief medical officer of Formula One. Sadly, Sid passed away a number of years ago. Um, but we were able to spend an evening in London chatting about his experiences and his reflections on safety after the death of his good friend, pictured here on the left, Ayrton Senna. Senna died about 25 years ago in a Formula One racing accident. Uh, and Sid was devastated. 
in the 25 years prior to Senna's death, about one racing driver had died a year in a Formula One racing accident. In the 25 years since Senna's death, I believe only one driver has died in an actual Formula One racing accident. That's a remarkable improvement in safety, not unlike the stats I showed earlier for aviation. But what Sid didn't do after Senna's death, although he had the credibility to do it, was he didn't go to the drivers and say, hey, everybody slow down, take it easy, don't take risks. What he did is he he campaigned for subtle changes to track design. He campaigned for the manufacturers to start looking at various safety improvements. He campaigned for the governing body to change some of the rules and he standardized medical facilities at Formula One tracks. So this is a remarkable improvement in safety and a lesson in system safety brought to you not by me as a pilot, but from a doctor. And, and you know, as pilots and I guess as air traffic controllers, but I don't know, and Helen no doubt will comment later. I think we we tend to assume that everything is about non-technical skills and behaviours because that's what we spend our time talking about. But we forget, for example, as pilots that we operate in a flight deck that is extremely well designed make it easy to get it right and hard to get it wrong so whether you're talking about where the gear lever is and how it's shaped and the flap lever and all that sort of stuff we work in a system that works well and sometimes i, I know pilots for example particularly will complain about system things about you know there's problems with baggage loading or something like that but the reality is although the system's not perfect it still does a really good job at helping keep us safe that is not true in a lot of other industries so whether we're talking about, say, drugs packaging uh, and, and, you know, for example, and I've had this conversation at the very top of the NHS about, you know, the, the purchasing power that the National Health Service might have, for example, um, but they still go and buy drugs that look alike, sound alike, but do dramatically different things. And they then give it to the people in uh, healthcare and say, hey, everybody, there's a risk here. You make sure you double check and don't make a mistake and don't get it wrong. We're giving them the error prone situation to deal with. Um, and, and here's an example. Uh, um, it's an anesthetic machine. Uh, it wasn't relevant in my late wife's case, um, but you can see there's a stool on the left where the anaesthetist will sit um, and uh, she or he will reach round to the side and you can see there's like a, a, a red arrow here pointing to a, a switch, a selector switch. In, in one position, that switch sends oxygen to the patient. In, in the other position, the switch sends uh, oxygen and vents it to the atmosphere for test purposes. Um, there is no guard on this switch. There is no alarm. There is no warning sound. There's no warning light. When this machine was first introduced 10 years ago, uh, it, uh, in the first month in one NHS trust, three patients almost died because that switch was in the wrong position. Eventually, of course, a patient did die, uh, but uh, the, uh, the regulatory body responsible for the machine, the MHRA, said it's fine. It's, it's got a kite mark. It's safe. Uh, yeah, it might not electrocute you by accident, but it certainly wasn't easy to get it right and hard to get it wrong. And it's taken another death 10 years later and a campaign by colleagues of mine that finally this is now being reviewed and uh, with the uh, hope that it will be completely regulated out of the system. Uh, and Ethetis, by the way, call this the death switch, if I didn't mention that. And don't even get me started on this, allegedly from a helicopter emergency medicine site, what could possibly go wrong? Now, I, I am going to move on to talk about behaviours because that's what, as controllers and pilots, we can influence. But I, I just want to reinforce the fact that the system really helps us to get it right. But there are still occasions, as I'll mention later, where the system doesn't help us. So what about behaviours? Let's talk about those for a moment then. So one of the things that I've been I've been lucky with, as I say, is I've got to work not just in healthcare but in other other safety critical industries as well, and it's given me a fascinating insight into what I believe are some aspects of how we work in aviation that you don't often see in other industries, and and I suppose for me there's kind of three areas that I see. The first is I think we're good at anticipation. 
we spend a lot of time both building our situational awareness to try and think ahead and to get to a think ahead level. We, we formalize briefings and we brief, um, you know, whether it's the start of a shift or whether it's the start of a takeoff or a landing or whatever it might be. We brief uh, how we're going to do it. We mentally rehearse in those briefings often, but but we also spend a lot of time just mentally rehearsing. And for example, as pilots, you'll be familiar with armchair flying, a concept that actually is is quite unusual when you look at other industries and other professions that you might think might want to do a, a similar thing. Obviously, that's formalized for us through the use of simulation. And we're very lucky that in, in air traffic control and in aviation in flying we have some really high fidelity simulation that's not always true in other industries but but it is often better than you might think it can be so for me anticipation is is one of the things that i think we do really well in our skills the, the other one is uh having an open style now what i mean by that is we talk about culture we talk about you know an organization having a just culture an open culture a learning culture um and and sure you know the leadership at the very top of an organization whether it's a regulatory body like the caa or whether it's your 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 particular unit that you're working at or your airline or whatever is really important to that but what we forget is there are subcultures so when we look at a hospital for example and we talk about a bad culture in an operating theater that operating theater is just one room with probably led by one surgeon the next door one might be completely different so you have these subcultures and in aviation we create these ourselves whether you're leading a shift whether you are um, the commander of a flight you create that culture over the time you're together as a team and and actually i think we're pretty good at that we're pretty good at creating this open culture by asking open questions by inviting intervention by thanking people for intervention and and you know not judging not blaming but being able to understand that we're all learning while we're going along and that to me again is something that i don't often see when i look at leadership across uh, other organizations and, and certainly in some organizations it's extremely rare and the third area of skill um, well, you know, this is a, I'm often reminded of this when I say this, uh, this lovely quote from Maverick, both in the first film and the second film, you don't have time to think up there if you think you're dead. I think we've all learned the value of slowing down that when things get really uh, dangerous, you actually just want to slow down a bit metaphorically sit on your hands for a moment and think about it let the human take control of the chimp reaction this again is quite unusual in other industries it's definitely not what's expected i remember i was doing some work for an engineering firm and uh, one of the things i was talking about was the value of being slow acting at times and the um the the member of the board who was responsible for safety got very uncomfortable at this point and he said to me i'm not sh i'm not comfortable with those words we want our frontline people to be working really hard and we want them to work fast we want them to work at pace there was a certain irony in this because this same organization had been fined over a million pounds by the hse because a worker got killed after they jumped into a situation to try and help out so I do think this is something that we do really well, that we should celebrate, if you like, and take pride in. And I think the other thing that when I, I, I reflect on what we do and what we do well, is that in terms of these skills, we've, they've become habitual. That we, we, yeah, I know we have SOPs, that we do SOPs, but actually this stuff we do because I think we just believe it's absolutely the right thing to do. And it has become a habit. And not only that, I think a lot of us develop extra habits that aren't SOP that allow us to maintain the resilience. And this is where the resilience of an operation comes from. When we do these things habitually, each of these three kind of skill areas, if you like, done habitually, really give the best chance of resilience in the operation, in my personal view and observation. But what we mustn't forget is that 
all this has to be underpinned by the culture and the systems of the profession and of the industry that we are in. And, and I think that's, you know, when we talk about culture and systems, we're not just talking about the organizational culture. We're not just talking about the, the tools and the kit we use, but we're talking about the whole system. So for example, when we're looking at um, a mistake maybe that was made by a controller or a pilot, we not only need to understand their actions and why it made sense at the time, but we need to understand how the training delivered them to that point as well. How did the regulation deliver them to that point? How did the manufacturer deliver them to that point? Uh, and obviously it goes without saying that, you know, I think, you know, we we perhaps need to deeply reflect on some of those issues. For example, when we look at something like the 737 MAX situation. The kind of final kind of thought I want to remind you of is that one of the things that we do have in aviation, which we're very lucky to have, is the ability to call stop. Whether that be literally as a pilot on the runway or a controller talking to somebody on the runway, or whether it be the closure of an airfield, whether it be uh, a ground stop, as the Americans call it, whether it be, you know, setting the park brake and sitting on your hands. And that is something that isn't open to other industries. And, you know, I've spent 15 years particularly working with healthcare, and sometimes they get irritated, not surprisingly, by the, by the kind of um, comparisons between aviation and healthcare. The comparisons work well in some small parts, but actually often don't work in other parts. And one of the parts where it doesn't work well is the fact that you can't call stop in healthcare, because if you do, if you close, for example, an unsafe department, then people will still come to harm because they can't access healthcare. And that's particularly, you know, at the moment why I've got enormous admiration for not just uh, our, our, you know, healthcare professionals in the UK, but actually around the world, because everybody's struggling uh, in that business just because they can't call stop now to what's happening, because by doing so, they'd actually make it worse. And the fact that we can call stop is something that I think is very valuable to us. Um, so I've just shared some brief thoughts with you. Um, Helen will, will now kind of have a chat and facilitate some thoughts. But uh, anyway, I hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much. And I'll be hanging around. Uh, before um, Helen starts, one very quick question for you, Martin. Stuart's asked, when you talked about the accident rate right at the start, is that a fatal accident or all accidents? I, I believe the data when I extracted it from Boeing's figures was whole losses and or fatal accidents. And it was based on just jet aircraft. It wasn't based on turboprops. So I'm sorry, I don't have the full data. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. Helen, it's over to you. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, so a uh, quick technical question, actually, first of all, for those of you who are attendees, can I ask you quickly in the chat box, just to write something like hello or a couple of squiggles or put a thumbs up or something, because I want to know if you put something in the chat box, if I can see it, and I'm not sure that we can yet. Okay, so Jez, yours has come on, but I think it's because you're a host or a panelist. Yeah, it doesn't appear we can see anything from anybody else. Oh, it says chat is disabled. Are we able to enable the chat? Do we know? Or alternatively, we could just use the Q&A box, couldn't we? That would probably work instead because I can see all your responses on the Q and A. Would that totally mess up the system, Mike? If we use that, 
I'm just trying to uh, enable the chat, but at the moment it's all going into the Q&A, so leave okay. me in the background. In that case, let's scrap that uh, and let's just use the Q&A box because I can see all the stuff that's coming out and I can see who's written it. So we're going to demonstrate our resilient adaptability here and we are going to use something else. I'm so not tight rated on, on Zoom, I have to be honest with you. So Martin's raised a really few interesting questions there, actually, and a few in really interesting statements. And the first uh, thing that really sprung to my mind uh, is um, when he brought up the grid system of the uh, ICAO EBT competencies, evidence-based training competencies. So just to give you a little bit of my history, actually, so I, I did spend 21 years as an airline pilot. I, I was with uh, Flyby the First as a Dash 8 captain. Loved that aeroplane. I know she was a bit marmitey, but oh my goodness, she was in a most amazing machine. And um, I also taught CRM, which is our kind of applied version, but like TRM, you would know in the ATC world, uh, CRM pilots, you'll be familiar with that, of course. Uh, I taught that for 14 years and for the last four years of Flyby the First's existence, then I was the head of the CRM training department. And then since I have, uh, since Having left Flybe when it collapsed in 2020, I did have a bit of a midlife crisis and didn't buy a sports car or a motorbike, but I decided to do a master's degree. So I too have completed a master's in human factors in aviation from Coventry and I graduated at the end of last year. Now, as part of my work in the last couple of years, uh, I was very fortunate to uh, initially gain a, a contracting role, but then initially a full time position with Nats. Um, some of you on the call may have um, experienced my fun and frolics on uh, OJTI refresher training courses and assessor refresher training courses. And for those of you in the airline world, that's fundamentally line training, TRI, TRE refresher courses that we, oh, hang on, uh, apparently the chat is now enabled for everybody. So let's see how that works. One of the areas that uh, uh, Martin mentioned uh, as I said these ICAO EBT competencies and I'm just going to list them out okay we don't have to remember them all we have situation awareness um, knowledge application of procedures manual flight automatic flight workload management problem solving and decision making communication leadership and teamwork now what's really interesting for me is that with the exception of manual flight and automatic flight all those competencies are transferred. They are transferable skills, workload management, problem solving, decision making, leadership skills, teamwork skills, situational awareness and communication are all the things that we use not generically within say to critical industry as Martin's explained within the healthcare side of things but they are all really prevalent within ATC as well and actually if we analyze those headline news and if we really broke down to the component parts we would see that there are a new number of those skills which are um, equally as not just prevalent um, but trained um, and important within the world of ATC as well. The only ones that we would change perhaps would be the what we call the technical skills, which in the airline world is referred to manual flight and automatic flight. But actually in ATC world, that's what we actually talk about, our controlling, our maintaining our separation, our streaming, the, um, the, the transfer of the aircraft from, from, um, from sector to sector. So actually these are really, really transferable skills. But the bit that I want to pick up on, which was really interesting, is where um, we had the grid and we talked about it being um, we have our anticipation and we work slowly and we, we have this open reporting culture. And he brought up a slide and it said it's become habitual. And I want to ask you, all, which is why I've opened up the question box now, actually, for you. If all these non-technical skills and all these desirable behaviours have become habitual. Can you consider for me any, any problems that might be associated with that? So we're talking about some really good behaviors here. We're talking about a really, really positive operational environment and they've become habitual. So what do you think, and if you put it into the chat box for me, please, what do you think could possibly be the drawbacks of having these behaviours that have become so habitual and so ingrained within our organisation and our operational environment.
Very good, Jess. There's some really interesting thoughts and comments here. There's a couple of you who have mentioned the word complacency um, and there's a resistance to choose an inability to improve. That's interesting. I'm going to come back to that one, Jez. I'm going to, I'm going to just skip over that one for a moment. We won't, we won't pick apart Stephen Shark's work just yet. Um, ah, now, Thomas, we don't give them enough importance anymore. The behaviours and actions become the norm. They are accepted but not challenged. Um, Tom, Tom, Tom Harrison, I'm going to pick up on your little comment there, actually. We don't give them enough importance anymore. PJ, Papa Julia Tanner, so PJ Tanner, uh, oh artmail.co.uk. Hello, I'm not entirely sure if your um, uh, microphone is supposed to be on, Phil, but that was lovely. Thank you very much for that. So we don't give them enough importance anymore. We forget to review. Can't You can't see all the comments, Graham. Oh, that's a shame. Well... Okay, well, I can, so I'll read them out to you. Uh, so what's really interesting for me from that point of view is that there's this assumption that by normalising it and becoming habitual, we don't want to change. Well, the question is, is that if it works, do we need to change? And this is something that we see often, you know, there's this perception that everything always needs to change. And yet, actually, do you know what? I don't think we give enough credibility credit for the stuff that we do well. The issue that we find, and those of you who have <laughs> sat through assess the refresher courses with me at, at Nats, uh, we have this assumption that when we are analyzing ourselves, when we are under check, and this would be in the airline world as well as the ACO world, when we're under check, when we're having our LPCs revalidated, when we are doing our SIM refreshers, when we are doing our continuous assessment, when we were doing our phase checks at, at ACO world, is that we look at the things that we need to improve. We've talked ad finitum about metaphorical sandwiches of giving feedback. Yes, we have to say something good, then we have to really get into the bit that we need to improve, and then we finish off with something good again. And there's this, there's this assumption that we always need to pick up on the bits that need improving. Now, Martin's implied here that there are organizations out there that don't do what we do, that they don't communicate effectively and they don't have the power to speak up and they don't have the shared mental models and they don't have this distributed situational awareness. I nearly swore then. Dit distributed situational awareness, I'm not going to swear again, uh, in, in these live operating environments. How often when you come out of a sim, or when you come out of a phase check, or when you come out of um, a continuous assessment, do you get told what went well and why it went well? How often do we really, really validate the stuff that we do well? Because out of the tiny little minutiae of things that occasionally go wrong, that are contributory factors towards incidents, towards accidents, and towards undesirable outcomes, actually, do you know what? There is a plethora of things that from day to day go well all the time. And the problem with having it as a habitual thing is that we normalize it. Oh, it's just part of the job. Well, of course, I expect them to do that. That's, that. that's what's expected of them. But I think it's really, really important that we recognize that actually there is a lot of stuff that we do well. And the other thing that I'm going to say is that there's a lot of stuff that we do well every single day of our working lives without really realizing it. So for all of you out there, for those of you who are pilots and for those of you who are controllers and for those of you who have just come along to see what's going on, I want you to think about the last day you were at work that was really memorable. Have a think about, you know, was it something out of the ordinary? Was it something that involved um, uh, some sort of emergency procedure? Was it a really, really challenging weather day? Did you have to divert somewhere? Were the systems down? Did you need to sort of adapt the facility? Did you have to then suddenly split a sector because it got really, really busy and it, nobody was expecting it? We can all remember those days. We can always remember those days where stuff happened. And if we pick apart at it and we say, well, yes, and I had to use this skill and I had to use that skill and I had to use this competency in order to achieve a safe outcome. 
But now I want you to think about the last day when nothing happened. Nothing went wrong, nothing happened, nothing out of the ordinary. For the pilots, I want you to think about when was the last ILS approach you flew? Have you been trained for that ILS? Controllers, I want you to think about the last time you were on shift and everything just went to plan. Have you been trained for that day? And it's so easy to say to ourselves, yeah, of course I have. You know, obviously I've been trained to fly an ILS. Obviously I've been trained to manage this sector in low traffic levels without any weather around. Of course I have. But actually, when we start picking it apart, pilots, just think about that ILS that you flew. Have you been trained to fly that ILS into that airport on that day with that crew member on that airframe in those weather conditions? with that particular defect present, with that controller, with that traffic in front of you, with that particular approach? Probably not. And actually that's because it would be impossible to train for everything. But what you're doing is you are demonstrating those desirable non-technical skills every single day you go to work. Because you're taking a framework, you're taking a concept, you're taking a structure, and you are adapting. You are using your situational awareness, your decision-making, your communication skills, your managing of workload, your uh, communication, I said communication, but like your technical knowledge of how to control the auto flight system. You're using your professional behaviors every single day to achieve a safe outcome when every single day is different. But I don't think we put enough emphasis into how well we do these things. Nobody would say, oh, you communicated that really well today. I felt really fine. And I really felt that my situation awareness was shared with you. And I really felt like I, I could make the correct decisions. But nobody does that because you probably sound like a bit of a nerd. But actually, I think it's really important to recognize that we do do these things. Um, and the other thing that I want to feed on to here, which and I'm going to pick up on situation awareness because it's one of my favourites, actually. One of the things that Martin said is that on occasions, and it, it involves our thinking skills. So it talks about sometimes you don't have time to think. And in an airline environment, we have to slow down and we have to really, really pick apart. And I, what I will say from a human performance and from an evolutionary viewpoint, that's really, really hard. There is this little bit inside you. Somebody described the amygdala, that little bit that fires that adrenaline into you as a little yapping dog, like a little yapping terrier. And it's always shouting at something. It's always looking at what's going to kill you next. And when it spots something that it think is going to kill you, oh my goodness, does it kick off good and proper. And to be able to override that, is really, really, really hard. And it actually bypasses our thinking brain. One of the problems we have with our thinking brain is that it's useless. It has no capacity at all. Our working memory, the bit of our brain that is processing things consciously and making sense of things. And I've likened it to having, remember BBC microcomputers? I don't know how old you all are out there, but we're talking about 32 kilobytes of RAM trying to power a MacBook Pro. OK, it is totally rubbish. So what it has to do is filter things out. And so we only train ourselves to focus on the things that are really important. And we can choose to direct our attention at a particular flight instrument or a particular point on the radar screen. Or alternatively, our brains are naturally kind of like looking for things that it thinks are important and discarding the rest. One of the things we often hear about when people are really, really busy is that they lose their ability to, to, to hear. That's not actually true. People lose their ability to listen, which is slightly different. They will always hear things. There's a sensory coming in, but they might not be able to process it. Which is all very interesting, Helen, but what's the point? Well, the point is, is that all this data is coming in all the time. It is always being absorbed through what's called our sensory register. And if you really, really analyze it, we always talk about having five senses, but it's been broken down as far as 21 different inputs that are coming in all the time. And if we consider the sense of sight, for example, it's not just, yes, okay, we can see things, but we can look at color, we can look at movement, we have depth perception. So that's kind of where I'm sort of going here. You know, if you start breaking down into its component parts, and our body is processing all of that all the time, but it only filters the relevant stuff into our thinking brain. 
And this is what actually this thinking brain is, is in a continuous cycle. And those of you who have taught CRM forever will talk about the perception, the comprehension and the projection element, which is that anticipation that Martin talked about of this is what I'm seeing. This is how it makes sense to me. And this is what I expect is going to happen next. That's that anticipation side of it. Notice, understand, think ahead. Now, sometimes our sensory register, that real unconscious loop of situation awareness, detects something that it can't make sense of. And it, it sees something or it hears something that it wasn't expecting. And sometimes we do not have the capacity at that moment as operators to actually determine what it is that the problem is. But we know something's not right. And I want you to think back to the situation where that's happened. The first warning shot that we will get as, as a human being is that we are, let's go back one, sorry. We are trained within our simulators and within our, um, uh, within our ATC, with our continuous assessment, to be able to diagnose what the problem is, to be able to understand what's not right and fix it. Sometimes as human beings, we are not capable of doing that. We do not know what the problem is, but we know that it's not right. And the only way that our bodies can transmit this information to us is by giving us a little bit of a warning shot. And it will sit there and it will give you that little niggle. And you'll sit there and you'll think, oh, something, something doesn't make sense here. Something doesn't feel quite right. And I'll tell you now, that on 98% of the occasions where you sense that something doesn't feel quite right, it's because it's not right. And though, if, if you take anything away from today, talking about maintaining your situation awareness, talking about these desirable behaviours, your human body, your brain is an exceptionally powerful machine. It will detect something is wrong way before you can make sense of what is actually wrong. And I think you should, I want you to respond to that warning shot. That time you sit there and you have that really uncomfortable feeling that something just doesn't make sense, speak up. Explain that you don't feel that something is quite right. Use those communication skills. Use your decision-making skills. Manage that workload. Talk to each other. All those things that we take for granted. Because if it doesn't feel quite right, it's probably not right. And that is the point to, to act on it. So from, I see so many overlaps from the airline world into the ATC world. In my short time at Nats, I could see so many desirable behaviours that we, we so take for granted. And what I want you to take away today is don't take those for granted. OK, they are very, very high performing, desirable skills. And I think it's about time that we acknowledged just how well we do all the time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Helen. Um, we've got some questions uh, already, and if people have any more questions, please um, type them into the Q&A box, please. Uh, question from Mike. Um, do people really change or can they learn new behaviours for both of you, I guess? Uh, absolutely, of course they could change. I think, I think what's fascinating about what we do is that you know we we often have very different personalities you know i think people outside of aviation assume that we're all very similar in how we behave i don't think we are at all we have some very different personalities but we do often behave in the work environment in the similar way and so a lot of that has to be learned both uh, through direct training direct input but also through actually just role modeling we learn from each other we learn what works we learn what's appropriate and and so I do think we do. It just might not be the way that you always expect that we would learn. Um, and and certainly I think I I can think of lots of things that I have changed in in how I behave over the years. Do we change our personality? I don't know. That's a question for a psychologist, not for a not for a pilot. But we certainly can change our behaviour. Absolutely. And I think um, that, that's a really interesting point, actually, that Martin's just made when we talk about personality clashes and personalities coming through. There's quite a difference between personality and behavior. And I always like to look at it as your personality is your default setting. It's your Windows safe mode. And that is the person that you are. And ultimately, 
it kind of sits in a subconscious area because you don't really control it, but you are aware of it. Whereas our behaviors are how we choose to um, conduct ourselves in a particular environment. And it's how we choose to display ourselves in a particular environment. And, you know, behaviors generally tend to be learned uh, because you'll do it through either through experience, through punishment, through reward, or through observation. You know, we've all seen the kid, at, the naughty kid at school getting told off for doing something and you think, well, better not do that. That's a learned behavior. But it's interesting that you say, can they change? Um, yes, they can, actually. But I think it's important to recognize that it's we're looking at behavioral change. We're not like talking to, we're not wanting to change people's personalities. We're not quite that bad yet. Uh, but we're talking about um, what is that desire? What is that motivation to change? And you'll often hear, you know, comments bounded around along the lines of, oh, well, you know, what's in it for me? People are only going to change if there's something in it for them. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that is a fundamental fact. The desire to change behavior has got to come from within. And finding that internal motivation is going to be unique to individuals. Some people are very conscientious and personally motivated. They want to succeed. They want to be the best person they can within a particular environment, be it an operational environment, a work environment, a home environment, a social environment. And they will want to be the best person they can. And they will consciously make that effort. Um, for some people, it could be just the fact that um, they uh, have recognized that in order to to be the best they can be at their job, then they need to change their behaviors. But just telling somebody they need to change isn't going to work. What we what is one of the big challenges from a training department, from from operations training and from flight crew training mm -hmm. is to instill that internal motivation to make people want to change for the better. That we can't tell them to change. They have to realize and decide that they want to change themselves. So yes, it's possible, but you need to be clever. Thank you. Um, question for me, actually. Um, so safety is typically measured by how many things go wrong. How do we change that to measure how well we do things? My favorite. So there's uh, some of you may or may not be aware uh, we have we have two views of safety. Uh, you have safety one and you have safety two. Safety one traditionally is already what you've just said, very, very reactive, looking at what's gone wrong and looking at how we can fix it. But what we need to ex explore is that if you think about a range of behaviors across a spectrum and let's look at, for example, um, landing technique. OK, in fact, let's use the dash. The dash was a pig to land. She really, really was. She, she had undercarriage made out of like reinforced concrete. And you could get some pretty hard, sporty landings out of that thing. Many of you have probably been on a dash and come back with some sort of crick neck, I'm sure. So she was a real challenge to lay, to land. And, you know, if you think about the the landing statistics, the approach and the landing statistics across the spectrum of dash eight operators internationally, then we put all the focus on the ones that are doing the hard landings, the long landings, um, the uh, fast landings, for example. She did actually land quite well a bit fast, but I probably shouldn't say that. Uh, so you put all your effort onto the people that are breaking the parameters and are on the exceedances. But what we've missed out is all the people in the middle who are, yeah, all right, <laughs> no problem, nothing going to flag up on FDM. Um, and then we also miss out the people from the other end of the spectrum that always do it really well. And actually, do you know what? Why do we do that? Most of the time it's because of resources, timing, cost, etc. But there's a huge education piece that I think all operators and control centers as well uh, could do is when you're looking at statistics, when you're looking at um, flight data monitoring, when you're looking at performance statistics, actually let's have a look at the trends at the other end. What are these people doing? so well that makes it go right all the time and then if I just swap hats and put my human factors head on then that is the fundamental basis of what we call user-centered design and actually why are we not writing the system why are we not writing the SOPs and the procedures around the behaviors of the people that are doing it really really well 
So that's what I would, that would be the first step, would be able to put a business case forward to get the resources, to analyze the people that are doing things well, analyze what is going on, the, 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 the power settings, the control settings, the radar ranges that you've got, the actual pace of, of um, controlling or the, the communication um, within the, between the pilot and the controller, all these little factors. And what is it that they're doing right? And then you use that to then start writing the policies. And I think it's, I'll just add into that. So there's a lot more interest and um, time being invested in understanding safety too in healthcare uh, than, than, and in fact, I've brought that back to where I work in terms of, you know, now on some of our CRM programs, for example, we'll, we'll show an example, not a disaster movie, but actually show here's a situation that a crew faced and look how they did it right. Uh, that's quite hard to do. Uh, because for all the reasons that Helen's previously talked about, that we we a normal day, nothing ends at the nothing bad has happened, and we just shrug our shoulders and we go home, whereas we're not necessarily picking up those things. I do think it's really important to learn from what goes well, and I do think Safety Two has has a lot of um, you know it, it, we need to learn ways it's still very new to everybody we still we need to learn how we capture those things the, the only caveat i will add to that is again because of my time in healthcare i also get to spend a lot of time working with people who have suffered loss or bereavement um, and we can't ever lose safety one we have a moral duty to 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 use safety one as well um, but we need to get a balance. And at the moment, I think we're very much still learning how we start to think about the good stuff. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, just to clarify, safety two does not replace safety one. Hmm. Safety two is kind of like um, the, the, the bolt on, if you like. Yeah. Okay, thanks both. I've uh, got a question from Tom Harrison. Uh, is automation of systems a real threat to, real threat to aviation safety? Do you think we will see accidents in future caused by skill fade and lack of practice due to automation? I'll give you I'll give you a quick view on that, and it's only a very personal view. Um, I think that you know a lot of us in aviation will talk about a loss of skills and how pilots or air traffickers in the old days could do things, you know, like this or like that. You know, they could fly an approach with two engines on one side out while doing this that and the other or they could control be overloaded and still control a sector and make all kind of i, I think we've not been de-skilled we've been reskilled, and and the evidence for that is the data i showed at the very start that you know we are now yeah there are certain skills we've probably lost a little bit but we have gained uh, a lot in terms of how we manage safety and resilience, both as pilots and air traffic controllers. So we have been reskilled in the science of safety in a way that, you know, the, the people who went before us were not skilled in the same extent in those areas. So, uh, which isn't directly answering the question. Uh, I think there is a there is a, always a threat to automation, but automation also brings benefits. And and so uh, my view is there is a balance here, but we always need to be mindful that when we automate something or when we change something, what are the unintended consequences? And that requires a lot of thought um, because I, I personally think um, the ability to do a lot of things manually is something that we should all be able to practice and should all have. Um, and there is a risk because at the moment when our systems degrade, they often leave us in a manual situation. So we have to be able to cope with that. But on the one hand, on the other side, that sometimes those systems bring such amazing benefits that uh, we'd be silly not to use them under most circumstances. I, did, I sounded like a politician when I answered that, didn't I, sir? Uh, I'll give myself a pat on the back for that. <laughs> Oh, good to see. Uh, do you know what? Automation philosophy is one of my absolute favourites. It's one of my hot topics. I love it. Um, is it a threat to aviation safety? OK, I'm going to put my pedantic head on and I'm going to say no. And it's not a threat because arguably we're in control of it. 
Okay, so if we think about how we define threats compared to errors and violations, actually a threat is something that is out of our control that poses a risk to the safety of the well, the aircraft and or its passengers in our situation or a risk to, the, uh, to safety. So is it a threat? I'm gonna say no, because actually as organizations, as an industry, we do have a say really in how much we are prepared to accept. Is it a risk? Yes, it is because of the philosophy behind it. And I think I mean, what one of my bugbears with automation, and I, I'm gonna say that out loud, um, is do we truly understand the philosophy behind the automated system that we're using? And there's a wonderful podcast out there. It's on the, it's on the BBC, um, sounds i think it is anyway it's a bbc podcast uh and it was done a few in 2019 uh, celebrating the anniversary of the lunar landings and it's done by kevin fong and there it, it basically analyzes every single minute of the 13 minutes to the moon that's what it's called 13 minutes to the moon and he picks apart every single minute and looks at the the the, the, the research and the developments and everything that go into that anyway helen what's your point my point is there's one episode on there that is entitled The Fourth Astronaut. And if you've got nothing better to do for an hour today, I would suggest you download that and listen to it. Because it's not about, it basically talks about the computer that was designed and was embedded within the, um, the lunar module to control the real sort of like the, the, the minutiae of landing that aircraft on the moon. But the way that Kevin talks about it is that he treats it as another person. Sorry, that's my husband opening a bag of something, that noise in the background. The, um, the philosophy behind that title is he calls it the fourth astronaut. And he treats this computer as a person. And you think of it as a person. And actually, do you know what? I think that's a really, really strong case there. And I want you to just have a think about when you leave this webinar today think about your autopilot think about your auto thrust think about your automated collision avoidance systems as another person and then i want you to really really question how effectively do you communicate with that person because actually do you know what there's a big piece there there's so many things that the automation will do for us that we don't know what it's going to do I mean, we, we won't talk about the 737 MAX at this point, obviously, but there's obviously a casing point. How do you know what your automated systems are programmed to do? Really ask yourself that question. And I say no, as opposed to hope or assume, which is slightly different things. So yes, I, I think there's a big piece there. We need to be really, really careful. In a lot of cases, there's, um, I think we need to be mindful that automation is said to reduce workload. I don't think it does. I think it might reduce task load, but it just moves the workload somewhere else. It moves it to a monitoring function, which actually with our 32 kilobyte BBC microcomputer, we are very bad at. We're not good at that at all. So yes, I would say it's a risk. I'm going to say it's not a threat. So on the basis of those two answers then, do um, the two of you think we need to change the way we recruit and train pilots and controllers? for those new skills? Hmm. That's a really hard, that's a really hard question to answer. I think there are probably, that is part of the equation. I think today's younger generation think differently. And, and I think that's a good thing. They're much more diverse in their thinking um they have grown up in a world of distractions which is both probably brings with it some skills and brings with it some threats and risks um and so inevitably anything in the future of aviation uh whether that be increased automation or not is going to require perhaps a different skill set but that's well beyond my uh, ability to answer i'm afraid and and probably there's there are very i don't think probably one person can answer that i think that requires a real kind of a lot of work over the coming you know years to really understand where we're going and what we're recruiting for 
Yeah, that, that, no, absolutely. And you know, what you just said there, you know, what are we recruiting for? It's all very well saying, well, we need to change the way we recruit. What to? Mm. Because if we don't know what we need and we don't know what we haven't got, then how do we know that we need to change it? So, you know, there's a preliminary piece there, I think, is to be able to identify, you know, are there weaknesses in the system? Are there are there challenges in the way that, you know, automation and systems management has developed over the years and is only going to change again? Let's face it, it's just it, it is going to continually evolve. And is that something that can be trained? Or is that something that could be innate within particular individuals? Because actually some people might be better at these sorts of things than others at making sense of the electronics. Um, I, I think it's it, it's a bit broad to say yes, until we've analyzed, is there a problem? You know, Can we change what we do now with the people that we've got? And until we've analyzed and identified what it is we need, then we can't say that we need to change the way that we we recruit people i think is that's a really broad way of saying i have no idea okay thank you um stuart's raised, raised the point um the trouble with black box automation is that unlike a human you can't discuss with it what it's planning to do next and what assumption it is making that it's made to come up with that conclusion any thoughts on that I think the only thing I'll add is one of the one of the roles, one of the companies I worked with um, to do with healthcare actually was a, um, a an AI company, um, Google DeepMind. Um, I worked with them for a couple of years, just helping review, uh, act as a reviewer of some of their work and ensuring that human factors was considered in what they were doing. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's interesting, Stuart, that where will where will that technology be in 10 years time and in 15 years time and in 20 years time maybe we will be able to discuss uh with our black box what we're thinking and share mental models and it's that uh, uh reminds me of how in uh 2001 a space odyssey for those of you who remember that film so i think uh yeah that i think we're, we're moving into a new phase, I think, in the coming decades, and I'm not talking about the next decade, but I'm talking much longer term of, of technology. I think Stuart's absolutely right. Uh, it is a fourth, uh, it's a fourth person, if you like, but it's a, but it's a person that we don't always are able to interact with as intuitively as we would like. Um, but uh, yeah, I think looking beyond that, I'm not quite sure what we will be how we will be interacting with communication and, and how things might change. I think the future could be quite exciting and interesting, um, but that's assuming that we're not completely automated out of the system. I think it's also worth, you know, discussing. I mean, it's, it's that's, again, that's quite a broad statement. Uh, it very much depends on what level of automation we're talking here, you know, and there's a lovely, I don't know if I'm going to show this because I've got my, my sort of weird blurred screen on, but there's a lovely, graph here that you can get in um it's who it was actually designed by uh decker and hulnagel concepts of task delegation so there's a little sort of phrase there that goes and it talks about levels of automation going from one to ten whereas level one is where the automation offers no assistance the pilot must take all the decisions and actions right down to level 10 which talks about the automation decides everything and acts autonomously ignoring the pilot now, I've done this exercise before with pilots. If you think about your aircraft and think about every single system that has some element of automation built into it, you actually find that it's most of them. And for the sort of automated systems that require just um, sort of general monitoring for hydraulic pressure or voltage across the bus bars, et cetera, then that's actually, you know, it's fine to give the automation that to do. But if we think about our, when we talk about automation philosophy, we often talk about the autopilot. The autopilot and auto throttles will plug those together under autopilot. And actually, the autopilot is the least automated system we have on board our aircraft. Let me say that again. It is the least automated system because it doesn't do anything without being told to. So it doesn't think. When you get in that aircraft, in Heathrow to fly to New York, it doesn't know it's going to New York. 
arguably when you get to New York, it still doesn't even know it's in New York. It's just done what it's been told to and it's got somewhere. Fantastic. So with this black box thinking is that when you say you can't discuss what it's planning to do next, that is one of the fundamental issues that we have with current, and if I use autopilot philosophy, is that it's telling you exactly what it's going to do next. It's telling you, you tell it what you want it to do. And it tells you what it understands that you think you've asked it to do. You are having a conversation with this thing. One of the problems that we have in modern day, particularly with PBN and, you know, moving to RNAV, um, SID, STARS, approaches, overlays, etc., is that quite often we don't know what it's telling us. Nobody has taught us to read ARINC. You know, if you if you if I brought up a set of ARIN coding now, I don't know how many people would be able to decode it and explain precisely what the autopilot is telling me that it's being programmed to do. There's a lot of assumption that it will just oh, it will just work. <laughs> Great, which is fine until it doesn't. And then we sit there and think, what the hell is it doing now? Well, it's actually doing what you told it to do. It's actually it's doing what it told you it was going to do. But the problem is, is that that level of comprehension, if again, if we think back to that ARINC as a person, that communication that we are having with it and it is having with us, there is a breakdown of communication there because we can't, we can't decode what it's telling us. So just, just bear that, have a think about that philosophy. The autopilot and the auto throttles are the least automated system on board that aircraft. It does nothing without you telling it to. Brilliant, thank you. Um, question from Mike. Um, how will reduced flight crew operations with a single pilot conducting a flight on his own change the environment and behavior? I guess we can extend that to cover single controller operations as well. I think, uh, let, let's just split the ATC and the pilot world here. One of the things that I learned very, very quickly uh, during my, my, my brief time at Nats actually is that fundamentally controllers work as what we refer to a single crew all the time you're always working as what we refer to a single pilot you know airline pilots you know that you know line training you know type rating sim line training takes about three months perhaps you know line training 20 sectors 40 sectors whatever it is depending on your whole you know certainly in the short haul world you can get through line training in about three weeks whereas in an area center, it could take a year and a half <laughs> to get through line training effectively, you know, the equivalent of line training. So they're always working as a single crew. And sometimes I know you have your tack and sometimes you have your planner, but ultimately that, that's not necessarily normal. It's not so you don't have to have that. That's kind of like a way of splitting the workload and it's a nicety, but you can work on your own. How will flight crew ops change environment behavior? Okay, so there's an area that is very, very at the moment unresearched, under researched, and under um, looked at actually, and that is the notion of boredom. How many times during line training, during your simulator training, do you practice being bored with nothing to do? And nobody does that. Even in a two crew operation, you do have that element of boredom, but at least you've got each other to talk to and, you know, maybe discuss the cricket or the weather because we're British and that's what we do. So I think there's an element there that we need to be really mindful is that the boredom factor is going to really, really kick in. And I would say it's as detrimental to performance as overload is, you know, as high workload, we don't look at low workload. And I think the other thing to be really mindful of with um, the potential for single crew ops, and this goes right back to what we talked about uh, with safety too, how many times on a flight or on a flight deck does having two people there, does somebody pick up a mistake? How many times do you check something? How many times does that quick interaction, just even a kind of a raised eyebrow or a shrug or a, or a thumbs up or a smile or whatever, actually stop something developing into something more significant? Nobody knows because we don't record it. So actually, again, we're always focusing on the, oh, well, look how expensive these pilots are and look how bad they make mistakes and look at, that's terrible English, isn't it? Look how terrible these pilots are. Look at the mistakes they made. Look at the fact they weren't communicating with each other. You know, the, the human is, is the failure in the system. But nobody is recording how often the human 
is the cog in the system that actually keeps the system functioning. And there's an area there, I think, that is desperately crying out for some more work. Yeah, I absolutely couldn't agree more. I think um, there are many things we don't understand. The only thing I would add to what Helen had said is that we're, we're perhaps getting an insight into single pilot operation by looking at um, single driver operation because we're now moving to um, highly automated vehicles on the road um, with drivers sitting there reading the newspaper or whatever they might be doing. And uh, yeah, it's not uh, it's not filling me with confidence, I have to say, uh, in in, you know, we really need to understand. And as Helen says, you know, and I know full well that as a as a crew, you know, how many things do you catch in a flight? It's a significant amount by just having two of you there. So, um, but we also, I think, have to recognize that technology, and again, going back to AI, technology is advancing a long way beyond where we're thinking at the moment. And so at the moment, it's technically not possible to operate an airliner completely automatically, despite everybody telling you that trials have been done and drones do it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but the reliability isn't great, particularly when you look at um, some of the operations of some of the big uh, US uh, military drones. Uh, I think their border force had a loss rate of about 10% for their fleet in one year. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a great, you know, I don't think we're, we're in a great position now, but the technology will push us into this very quickly. And so the research that Helen has talked about needs to be done sooner rather than later. And we probably need to be capturing those lessons about what we're doing right now to to resilience to make sure that when this stuff starts to happen that we we have some data to make sure it's safe notice i'm not saying we should stop it because i don't think that will necessarily be allowed by society and by technology but we have to make sure we have the information to understand what it's all about and and have the information before we go too quickly into it Great, thank you. Um, I had a question from Gaz. Let me just look it up. Sorry, um, he's asked me to ask you to describe a situation where you think you did well. I guess that's in your role on the flight deck. Uh, oh, that's a stinker. That's a, yeah, it's an interesting one, Gaz, because you're you're kind of yeah making me uh, yeah yeah oh you're making me think there i i i mean i would just pick actually i've just done three days at work flying um total of uh six sectors um and i think in each particular case we we arrived safely at what we were doing um yes there were mistakes and errors made on the way but as a crew, we were resilient and able to um, to pick those up um, and make sure that we ended the flights safely and completed them safely. So I would like to think that the vast majority of the operation was was good. It was because not much happened, if that makes sense. But it wasn't perfect. Uh, and I think, you know, I. I I go back to the slide I showed at the very end of my presentation that people think success is just a linear a straight line success is about you know those little setbacks those little failures those uh, what I call little mistakes happen all the time but our role is to stop them becoming big mistakes so basically any flight where I've done that I think is probably a, a good day out um, I'm not sure that exactly answers the question you want to know Gaz but uh, uh, that's the best I can give you I think I think to add to that, I mean, this is a beautiful demonstration, really, of just how hard it is. You know, there's an element of the fact like, oh, um, my God, what did I do well? But there's, I think there's also an element of our, of our very British culture that we don't like to blow our own trumpet. I think we're, and particularly in this industry, we're so conscientious, we're so self-critical that actually admitting to our peers that we think yeah I did really well today actually that was a really really good day out uh look how well we managed these problems look how well we communicated with everybody etc cetera, etc cetera. you just feel like a, a bit of a dork <laughs> I think to be honest with you 
Um, but, you know, arguably, I would say that every day where you think mm, nothing really happens was the day that went well, you know, because there were probably, and if we look at, you know, a quintessential Swiss cheese model, there were possibly a huge number of holes in that day that were, were nipped in the bud at a really, really early stage because of having this open questioning culture within the flight deck, having these really strong communication links between the flight crew and the cabin crew and ATC, having these shared mental models, making these decisions and reckon, and hoping that you know, everybody's happy with those decisions, using your experience and your intuition to, to do the right thing at the right time and do what you think is the best thing to do. But it's a it's a lovely question because it just shows how hard it is to really answer it. And I think I think for me, it's, it's interesting because you got me reflecting. So one of those particular flights I did, we were going into Oslo. Uh, they were right on the verge of going into Cat 1, but the forecast basically it could have been anything. It could have been uh, freezing drizzle. It could have been snow. It could have been fog. And the forecast basically gave every option and possibility. Uh, on the uh, on the approach, we we were thrown a curveball because the aircraft ahead went loss of comms, and air traffic had to slow us up and give us vectors, etc. When we eventually got on the approach, we landed. Basically, the conditions were slightly better than Cat One. Um, there wasn't contamination on the runway, but we thought there might have been. Um, so breaking out visually at minima and, and doing a manual landing, then landing onto possibly a contaminated runway, vacating off a contaminate, possibly contaminated runway, um, all those things. But actually nothing happened. Uh, we'd anticipated everything apart from the loss of comm situation anyway. Um, so so actually it just worked. And I think that that for me is a good day. I'm just going to say something on that. Actually, that, that's triggered. That's triggered a little light bulb in Helen land somewhere. Uh, so that's really interesting that you said, you know, nothing happened. You had the aircraft in front of you suffered loss of communication. There was all sorts of things that you thought, oh, this could happen. That could happen. We'll slow up. We'll do this, that and the other. Um, I remember having a big discussion uh, recently. What was it? Nats, actually, uh, regarding moving away from PHF comms to, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Like data link. Like, mm. Text messaging, basically. Let, let's WhatsApp the pilot as opposed to actually talk to them. But it's a really interesting thing in terms of our situational awareness, because if you think about just how much information we get and how much we adapt our behavior and how we adapt our aircraft management and our aircraft handling, particularly in you know, energy management situations, based on what's going on around us and what we're hearing. And I think if there's, you know, with a move to with a move to looking at exploring the possibilities of moving more to data link, WhatsApp, uh, then, you know, there's a real risk of a real significant loss of situation awareness from, from the pilot community there. So that's really interesting. Again, you know, you've, you've used an example there where this data coming in, you think, is that relevant to me? Yeah, it is actually. So what are we going to do about this? Well, actually, let's bring this feedback. Let's really listen to what's going on. Are they going to do a missed approach? Are they going to land? Are we going to get a, a report as to where they've landed? Are they going to be able to ev evacuate the runway? Evacuate, get off the runway. Uh, you know, there's all this stuff that you're listening to that is controlling how we manage our own flights. And there's a big risk of losing that with a with a move towards data link. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And, and, you know, we could hear the loss of comms happening, if you know what I mean. And it was then... <laughs> what a lovely irony. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can hear loss of comms. And, and then the control <laughs> was explaining to us why they were giving us a vector and why they were slackening our rate of descent and, uh, and change of level, etc. So all those things were kind of going on. And, and that's a really good point, actually. So, yeah. So as much as I'd like to say it was all down to the crew, it was actually down to air traffic as well. One uh, last question. We've got just over, just under ten minutes to go. Um, the, day, well, the question Helen asked a while ago um, uh, at the start of her presentation: What's the danger of having a gap between what we're doing as controllers and pilots uh, to make the operation work, and what our management or what our safety teams think we're doing? What's the danger of that, and how do we stop that uh, risk occurring? Funnily enough, I had a. Uh, on the original presentation, I took it out in the end just because of time, but on the original presentation, I had one of uh, Steve Shorrock's diagrams of workers imagined versus workers done. 
Um, Steve Shorrock, for those of you who don't know him, has been incredibly influential in just culture work in Euro control. Uh, is probably one of the leading human factors thinkers, I would say, in healthcare right now as well. Uh, and um, really is, you know, quite an amazing person. Um, and I think what when I, you know, when I look at other industries, you know, for example, I look at, say, Formula One um, and and the difference between work has done and work has imagined is is negligible. You know, for example, yes, OK, if you're a team principal, you're sitting in the pit lane, you're, um, you know, your your driver is out there driving, but you know precisely what the driver is doing. You may not know how they're feeling, but you know exactly what they're doing every microsecond, uh, which is why they can, the telemetry provides them with so much information. And that enriches that relationship then when they can discuss afterwards you know what was happening etc in aviation it's slightly different you know generally your shift supervisor for example will be a current controller um, when you're talking to uh, airline management the operational management are normally pilots they go out and fly not as much as they would like probably but they still get to fly so the difference between workers imagined and workers done is is very small and then when i go to a hospital the chief exec um and the, the board will probably have a sense of their overall picture and their big responsibilities but they won't really have a sense necessarily of what it's like on a ward at two o'clock in the morning when a a nurse with two years experience is having to make the call about whether to accept a patient onto what is her ward um, and being badgered by doctors from intensive care, for example, to accept a patient who maybe shouldn't be in there for their own safety. And that gap between work as done and work as imagined is vast. And, and that's where the dangers happen. And so, you know, certainly on a flight crew side, I can say that I am extremely grateful that all my flight managers of whatever role they have do have an awareness of what goes on in the flight deck. They do go and fly once a week or whatever it might be. They do see the real problems, even if they can't change them, they understand them. Um, but as far as what it's like in air traffic control, I don't know. I'll pass over to Helen because I've got no real knowledge of that. I think, you know, we, we're talking about workers imagine work has done um, and there's there's various other spouts of that kind of tulip star. I think it's going to be called a little flower myself, a little tulip diagram. And if any of you are interested, just Google it and it comes up with a lovely little picture. But I think the the, the more interesting one for me uh, is the workers demonstrated paradigm. So you have workers imagined, which is how the organization envisages that workers work. They follow these procedures. They do these checklists. Workers done is the reality out on the line um, or in the live operational environment that sometimes it's just not practical or it's just not feasible to do X, Y and Z. And so you, you, you find a workaround, basically, you, you find a way of fixing it because we're all conscientious individuals. And ultimately, we want we want the mission to go ahead. But. One of the areas that I think we need to be really careful of, and this is where we kind of look at things like um, organizational drift, for example, is the difference between work as done versus work as demonstrated. So the work as demonstrated is what you show people that you do when they're watching you. So when you're under check, when you've got in the when you're in the simulator, when you're on a line check when you're having just a, a, a continuous assessment done, when you're doing a phase check, when you've got somebody watching you, you'll probably do stuff a bit differently. You'll probably just be that little more careful. You'll probably just make sure you've got every single I dotted and T crossed. And the research I did for my master's degree actually looked at very much focusing on decision making behaviors, um, comparing live operations to the simulator. And actually, what are the drivers between from decision making? What, what drives your decision making process in those two environments? And they were quite different, which is another conversation to have on another day, frankly. So I think um, I think within I think with the aviation 
industry and holistically, I think that work as imagined versus work as done is close enough. We have to accept that within a dynamic safety critical industry, when we've got multiple, where it is a system, you know, as multiple complex systems thinking, you are always going to have to have those elements of variability. That That's just how the system wouldn't function otherwise. And it's a case of managing that variability to make sure that we still stick within the safety parameters. You know, if this is a safety parameter, this is the, this is the line that, you know, is, is described, is, is the work is imagined. And there has to be an acceptance that, human variability will dip each side of that line but you remain within those safety parameters the risk we have to be careful of is that when that normalization that normalization of deviance or normalization of deviation however you want to call it when that starts slipping when the accepted norm starts dipping below the prescribed norm we're still going to have that variability and the risk there is that when we dip outside the safety parameters and that's you're only going to assess that when you observe what happens for real. But when you're observing what happens out on the line, people behave up here. So there's the issue there. I think I, I, I don't know what the answer is, because as soon as you're observed, you have that observer effect. You will always behave differently. But how do you measure the differences between workers done, normal operations, normal variability and workers demonstrated? There's the area that I think could needs to be looked at potentially a little bit more. Brilliant, thanks Helen. Um, we've kind of run out of time. Um, this <laughs> session will be available oh, really online lost. in due course. Um, Mike, what's the details for seeing it online? Are you there? Uh, I am here and uh, what we'll probably do is collate all the all four events and then uh, release them all in one go at the so that'll be at the end of January beginning of February okay thank you uh, our next session is uh, this time next week Monday 23rd of January and it's a chance for pilots and controllers to put questions to each other so if there's a question you've always wanted to ask and I'm going to ask Olivia who asked a really good question right at the end there to save that question for next week uh, my thanks to Martin and Helen, uh, two great presenters, uh, really good presentations. Thanks very much for that. Uh, thanks to Gatco and Babalfa for putting this on. And of course, thanks to the audience for your participation and um, hopefully see you next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>